is there. You can grab one. I know the kids are dying to take one home. You can take it home after church, after church, not now. You just go back there and sword fight, and the Sunday school teachers will be mad. We don't want that, all right? You can palm, you can palm branch fight later, all right? I'm sorry, parents, if that, you know, you can tell them, you can put them in the blender if you need to later. Uh, whatever, whatever you need. I love Palm Sunday. I love that this, this moment of worship, right? This beautiful moment of worship that's captured in the Gospels. As Jesus comes into the city, everyone raises their hands. They throw their coats. They raise palm branches and tree branches. And they, they say, Jesus, you're welcome. Hosanna, save us. Save us. They shout those three things. They shout praises. They shout praises. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they say, Hosanna. They say, save me now. Hosanna, save me now. And they honor Christ. I think it's noteworthy to say that those people were giving. They, now, we had a donkey in here for Christmas. That donkey relieved himself on the carpet. <laughs> now, who knows? If you put your coat on the ground, it's in danger. You know, I mean, here comes a donkey. You're going to put your coat on the ground? I mean, really, there was a sacrifice. I'm throwing my coat on the ground. I'm giving monetarily. I'm giving of my wealth. I'm giving of my being. I'm saying, it's his. Save me. They honor Jesus. They honor Jesus this day. And yet, Palm Sunday is a paradox. Palm Sunday is this, this confusing day because we know the story. We've read. Palm Sunday, they welcome Jesus into Jerusalem and just days later, they crucify Jesus. It's a paradox of the human heart. Today we welcome him and tomorrow we reject him. One day we shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. And then we say, crucify, crucify. This is the story of the human heart. This is the story of your heart and my heart. And it is the story of Israel. But I want to ask the question, why? Why is it that we're like this? Why is it that Israel would welcome him with such celebration and such worship and praise and then reject Jesus just days later? Why is it that we do this? The answer is really very simple. This is a very simple message. Because Jesus comes to be king. Jesus comes to be king. He comes to be king. He, he, he upsets the apple cart. See, we want a savior that will serve us, but he comes as a king that would be served. He is a king. Now, I want us to look, we're going to look at Mark, but I want to tell you that Matthew and Mark tell a very similar story. And I think that uh, maybe some of the answer of why this would happen, why this contradiction of praise and crucifixion why this contradiction of welcoming our Savior and then rejecting our Lord and Savior happens? And I think we see it immediately following the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In Mark chapter 11, we see this celebration day. And then we see the next two stories recorded in both Matthew and in Mark, I think, tell us a lot about why he was rejected at the end of the week. If you're there, we're going to read in verse 12. So Jesus has been welcomed, Jesus has been welcomed into the city. They threw down their, their branches. They threw down their coats. They said, Hosanna, Hosanna. Now the next, the next two stories are very peculiar. Verse 12. On the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree that was in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, and he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs, he said, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it, which means, and he said it loudly so that everybody could hear. Now, some people get cranky when they're hungry. 
Do you get cranky when you're hungry? I don't know if this is this a moment where Jesus is just cranky because he's hungry. Like really, I mean, Jesus kind of goes like a little right bananas here. And I think it's, we're like, what? what's going on, Jesus? Did Jesus really just curse the fruit tree? I mean, that seems crazy, right? I mean, it's almost, it seems like that person you see who's like just pounding on the vending machine. Give me my Snickers. I am hungry, right? I mean, you're like, why is Jesus cursing a fig tree? It seems beneath him. We all just sang praises to the king. We all sang praises to Jesus, and now he curses a fig tree? Hmm. Why? Why? Why would he curse this fig tree? Well, he curses the fig tree, let me just say, because the fig tree had leaves. It says that. If the text tells us it had, he saw in the distance a fig tree. He saw that it had leaves, but it did, then he went up to it to get some figs, and it didn't have figs. Now, it also says, but it wasn't the season for figs. The, sea, the figs shouldn't even been there. But here's the thing. And see, we don't know this, because you and me, we're not fig farmers, if there is such a thing. All right, but I did some research on figs this week and fig trees. Did you know fig trees can, uh, can produce figs and have uh, three crops in a season and four crops in a season over and over again? But one of the things that's most notable and, and, and makes us understand this, see, now the Jewish readers of the books of Matthew and Mark, they would understand this, but we don't because, we're, again, we're not fig people and we don't know anything about better, so I have to explain if a fig tree has leaves, it should have figs. See, when a fig tree grows and it begins its season, the first thing the fig tree should have is figs, followed by leaves. So this fig tree had leaves first, then figs. So the leaves are something that should let you know this tree probably has figs. So Jesus, and now it all of a sudden makes sense. Jesus sees the fig tree in the distance. It has leaves. He goes, Snickers time. And he goes over to it and he checks it. But there's no figs. They're gone. See, Jesus, and this gives us a picture of why it is that the, the people accept Jesus one day and reject him the next. Because Jesus is setting an example. He's teaching a lesson. What's the lesson? The lesson is very simple, that Jesus will confront you on what you're supposed to do. Jesus gets in your face. Did you know that? If you follow Jesus, Jesus will not leave you alone, will he? Amen. He loves you too much. He loves you too much to leave you alone. Just like my kids. My kids, uh, right, and maybe you have kids and maybe you have children in the neighborhood, right? right? If you want them to grow up and to be wise and to be good and godly children, then you correct them, right? Now, and the truth is, is sometimes we parents, we're lazy. And we go, you know, they are tearing it up out there. And I'm not doing nothing because I don't want to. <laughs> right? I mean, but that's not loving, is it? It's not loving to be like, you know what? They're playing with, you know, the tools in the garage. I don't want to do it. Just, don't let, just let them play. Just let them play. I hear a saw. Just let them play. <laughs> right? That is not loving. A loving father goes, what are you doing? A loving father corrects their children, and that's exactly what a loving Lord does. A loving Lord will not leave you alone. He will say, you need to have figs. Where's the fruit? Remember, where's the beef? That's what Jesus was really saying. Jesus was saying, where's the fruit? And I think that's the word that you and I need to hear so often. I think Jesus needs to come into our lives and shake us and go, where is the fruit? Where's the fruit? I don't see any fruit. This is nothing but leaves. Jesus loves us enough to say, this is what you're supposed to do. And I think for the most part, I think we know what we're supposed to do, don't we? If you're a follower of Jesus, he, you hear his voice. You've read the word. You know. 
fact, some of you right now, there are things you know God is telling you to do. But you haven't done them. And that's exactly it, isn't it? There's a whole lot of people that are just like this. They're nothing but leaves. They're all talk. Right? We're a country of talkers, aren't we? Man, people, people talk a big talk. They just, right? You probably know some people, some people <laughs> that are just like this, right? They, oh, they talk about all the stuff they're going to do. The projects and the dreams. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. But they don't do it, do they? They don't do it. See, Jesus gets in our face and says, you need to do it. You need to love your neighbor. You need to pray for those who persecute you. You need to give to the poor. You need to do it. Stop trying to look the part with all your pretty leaves. And let's see some fruit. Let's see some fruit. Hmm. See, things aren't always the way they look. This is really one of the number one complaints of people in the church. It's people say, well, the church, you know, they act this way, but they're not really that way. They act like they love everybody, but oh, they don't really love. They're not really welcoming. They don't really care for the poor. They don't really forgive people. They don't really do all the things that Jesus taught. There's no fruit. It's all leaves. It's all leaves. In the, you know, if you buy a car, in the car is less than it looks. This is, uh, my wife's first car was a Plymouth Horizon or a Dodge Omni. It's the same exact car. That's it right there, except for it didn't come with the collie. All right. <laughs> All right. 1987 Plymouth Horizon. That was my wife's first car. And her, uh, her grandpa bought, uh, helped her buy it. She saved up the money to buy this nice car. She, it had good looking tires on it. He kicked tires. Oh, it looked good. No dents. The body was in good condition. I mean, it was beautiful. Oh, it looked great. The interior, well preserved. Oh, it looked good. Turn the car on. Mm -hmm. It sounded good, right? You know, oh, it just looked good. She bought the car. That car was what we call a lemon. Yeah, you ever buy a lemon? Right? Yes, I know something. You don't have to admit it. Right? Sometimes we buy lemons. Cars that look good, but they're not good. Right? Or maybe a house. Right? That looked really good. And then, oh, it has foundation problems. It has this and that. And, you know, it's leaking this and all this. That's exactly what happened. That car, Katie's, it would die in an intersection. It did it multiple times. She would just slow down. It would die. In the intersection, she, she, she got rid of it one day. She was just, she, it, it brought her to tears. She was terrified of this car, and r rightly so. I mean, we tried to make it look cool. We, <laughs> we, did, we, pri we painted it bright Corvette yellow. <laughs> Corvette yellow. I put a big stripe on it. We were kids, right? We put a big, you know, we put a big stripe on it and pretended it was a race car and all this. You know what? That stripe and that paint job, it didn't do anything for that car. That car was a lemon. We made it look more like a lemon. That's what we did. Right. It was a lemon. It didn't drive well. You know what? I would much rather have a car that run, runs well than looks, well, runs good than looks good. Right? Isn't that what you want? I want a car that runs. I don't want a car that looks good. I want a car that runs, that doesn't die in the intersection. I want a car that has fruit, not a car that has leaves. I want to ask you a simple question. Have you been ignoring what you know Jesus expects of you? But that's not the only story. So Jesus gets into the city, and the first thing he does is he curses the fig tree. He curses the fig tree to remind the disciples and to remind the people that God has an expectation of fruit. Secondly, verse 15 we have another interesting story, one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. And it remains here as one of the first things Jesus does when he enters the city. Verse 15 says, And they came into Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and bought in the temple. So one of the first things he does, in fact, Matthew puts it in reverse order, I think. I think it has uh, the, this, this temple experience first. So Jesus comes and he's welcomed into the city and everyone shouts his name, Hosanna, Hosanna. And he goes to the temple the next day and he drives out those who sold 
and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats. I sometimes wonder in my sanctified imagination if there were people in those seats. <laughs> I don't know, but in my sanctified imagination, there were. He overturns tables. He overturns seats of those who sold pigeons and would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. As he was teaching and he was saying to them, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. He's quoting from Isaiah 56. He says, but you've made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes, they heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him. See, we see it immediately in the scribes and in the Pharisees. They immediately become threatened. Oh, yes, everyone may have welcomed him the other day, but today he is in our face, not only saying what we should do, but what is he doing now? Now he's telling us what we shouldn't do. He goes right into the temple and he says, this is not right. And he doesn't just say it like that. He doesn't just get his little finger out. No, no, no. He flips over chairs. He flips over tables. And he says, get out. This is not what the house of God is about. Now, I'll just give you a little background. Now, why exactly? Maybe some of you are like, I don't understand why he flipped the tables. And what, was the, what were the money changers? Well, what this was about, this is Passover time. And so people would come from all around. The Jews would, Jews would come to give sacrifice at Passover to the temple. And so they would come, and there were multiple things. They would exchange money um, because actually the temple had to have a, a certain kind of gift. And they, they didn't want to receive coins with, with images and things like this. So there was a money exchange going on. And there was also trying to buy and sell in the temple using the currency uh, that was used at the time. And so it was essentially, it was like a little bank, right? If, you want, if, you're, if you've ever been on an overseas or international trip, you have to change your money, right? And I changed my money into pesos or into whatever Canadian money is. I don't even know what that's called, right? What does Canadian money have? Is it just called Canadian money? Canadian dollar. Well, that's not very interesting, is it? All right, whatever. You know, everybody has like yen and the Deutschmark and they have Canadian dollar. Okay. <laughs> All right, whatever. So you have to exchange your money. And so they would exchange money. But guess what? When banks do that, they take a little bit of your money. They make a profit on the exchange. Not only so, one, that they had made a little business in the church, the temple, to make a little profit on the exchange of money. Not only that, they were also selling pigeons. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with selling sacrifices. Pigeons were a sacrifice that was acceptable. But there's, and there's nothing wrong with selling pigeons. That's totally okay. Just don't do it at church. This isn't the place for you to make a profit. Can I, you know what? This is not in my, uh, in my outline, but I just want to remind you. Not the place for you to sell stuff. Uh, just that's all right. You know what? And I, that comes from if you, you know, you're one of those people, you sell Tupperware or you sell insurance. Please don't do it here. This is church. This isn't the place. It doesn't go outside. <laughs> you can go in the parking lot. I'm serious. I, I mean, I, I, don't do it. I mean, Jesus, this is the most violent Jesus ever looks. And it's when people come to buy and sell in the temple. I would just be careful. All right. Because I don't want Jesus flipping my chair or flipping my table. Amen. Just saying, I don't want it. Buying and selling. So Jesus not only confronts us on what we are to do, but what we are not to do. And this is exactly why the worshipers crucify Jesus. Because Jesus gets in our face. He, won't, he loves us too much to leave us alone. He loves us too much to leave you in your sin. He will tell you what you are to do, and he'll tell you what you're not to do. And this is exactly why biblical Christianity in the United States is under attack, because this is the rubbing point. This is why we reject Jesus. This is why they killed Jesus. And this is why each and every one of us have crucified him over and over and over again. Is one day we say, save me, save me. And then we reject him and say, crucify him, crucify him. 
Jesus goes on. You can go through Matthew and Mark. The next section, he then be, uh, continues to uh, essentially offend the Pharisees and the scribes and to offend them to say, you shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. Then he does not only that, but then he goes into, especially in Matthew, but even in Mark, in Mark chapter 13, he goes on to also tell them the wildly popular stories of persecution to come. The end is coming. Tribulation. Hell. People don't want that stuff. They want a savior. What did they chant? They said, Hosanna. What did Hosanna mean? Save me. Everybody wants a savior. But not everybody wants a king. See, that's the, that's the, that's the sticking point. Everybody, everybody will come out and they'll raise their hands and say, save me, save me, save me. But what we have to say is, save me, Lord. See, the people, they were all leaves. They were all palm branches. And they were no fruit. All leaves and no fruit. They were all talk. No action. They talked to the big game, right? They come to church and they said, oh, I love Jesus. Maybe you even raised your hand. Maybe you even listen to that pastor, crazy Pastor Tim, and you raised up a palm branch and you raised it for a minute. But that was about as far as your sacrifice goes. All leaves and no fruit. See, the problem is, is this is exactly where our hearts end up so often is we talk a good game but there's no action we say the words and only God knows your heart brother and sister but do you mean them I'm not judging you but I am asking you to ask yourself those questions do you mean what you say do you mean what you say when you say I will follow I will give my life. Do you mean it? Do you mean it? See, it was the worshipers that crucified Jesus. The people who welcomed him. I want to say this is one of the scariest truths that we see and that Jesus teaches about in many texts is there is such thing as a false convert. Many, many will say, Lord, Lord. Many, many will wave branches and say, save me, save me. There will be many a revival. In fact, I have read recently some very depressing statistics on revivals and how many revivals will have overwhelming folks coming forward and saying, save me. But then they don't come back to church again. And then they don't live the walk. It doesn't change them. They'll, they'll do just like the people did. Just like all the worshipers. Save me. Save me. They wanted a savior, but they didn't want a king. Jesus came to be king, brothers and sisters. Jesus comes to be king. He curses the fig tree for not having figs. And that's Israel. And that's the human heart. And so often we want to say, save me. We want to make a big show of it. But there's not a change. And Jesus curses that. He curses it. Remember the Snickers bar? I mean, the flip out moment. May you never have figs again. The scripture goes on that the fig tree withers and dies. This is how God feels of the Christian, of the follower. That's all leaf and no fig. All leaf and no fruit. Nothing to change. Are you all leaf and no fruit? Are you all talk and no action? When was the last time you shared your love of Jesus? When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? When was the last time you prayed with your family? When was the last time you prayed in public? 
When was the last time you taught someone about Jesus as He commands us to do? Remember the Great Commission? Go into all the world to make disciples, teaching them everything I have commanded you. When was the last time? So often, Christians, we're all leaf, no fruit. We're all talk and no action. And this morning, I want to ask you if you want to make a change. Because, see, Jesus doesn't call us. Jesus doesn't call us just to be attenders of a church. He doesn't call you to just come here once a week. He calls you to be fundamentally changed and to have fruit in your life to repent of sin, those things you're not supposed to do, and to live lives of holiness and praise, the things you're supposed to do, to live lives of mission and servanthood. Please hear me. It's easy to say, save me. It's harder to say, save me, Lord. Romans 10, 9 is one of my favorite scriptures, and I think many of you know that I quote it all the time because I think it tells us exactly what John 3.16 sometimes leaves out. John 3.16 says, Whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. Believes what? Believes that Jesus Christ is God. Believes that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, died for your sins. Believes that He is King that He is Lord, that He is Master. That's what we're to believe. But see, sometimes we, we, don't, we don't know. We're like, well, what does He mean? Believe what? So I go to Romans 10, 9, which says it very clearly. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe that Jesus is Lord and, be and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, it says, you will be saved. You will be saved. See, Romans 10, 9 is my favorite scripture to walk with someone to understand the gospel because it explains what we are to believe. We're to believe that he's the king. Not that he's just insurance. Not that he's some life preserver. But he's to be a king. And that as king and lord and master, he expects fruit. He expects change. Is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your Lord? Have you made Him the Lord of your life? I want to give you the opportunity to respond this morning to that simple question. He came and He dies. This week at Easter, we celebrate this week, we celebrate His death and resurrection, that He would die for you and that He would be resurrected for you. He gave his life and he expects the same from you. Will you give him yours? Because that's lordship. When we say it's all yours, God, it's all yours. So I want to ask this simple question. Are you interested in being totally changed by Jesus Christ? If you're interested in being totally changed by Jesus Christ, it's just this simple. You pray a prayer to say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm on my way to hell. I can't save myself. I believe. I believe that you lived. I believe you died. The perfect man for me, that you rose from the dead. I believe in who you are. And I want you to be the Lord of my life. And the scripture says, not Pastor Tim, the scripture says, and you receive salvation when you receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's just pray this prayer, because I think there are some here this morning that want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and have never done it. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord, then right now, you pray a prayer in your own heart with sincerity and truth. But you, only if you want to be changed. 
Only if you want to be changed. If you want to be changed by Jesus Christ, you pray this prayer with me. Not just to be saved by Jesus Christ, but to be changed by Jesus Christ. Because He will expect fruit. If you want to be changed by Jesus forever, you pray a prayer like this with me right now. Lord, save me from my sin. I believe, I believe, Jesus, that you're God. I believe, Jesus, that you came, that you lived the perfect life, born of a virgin. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose again, conquering sin and death. And I want to follow you forever. I want to confess you to be Lord. I want to follow you. I want to follow my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. And I love you. Help me. Help me follow you. If you just prayed that prayer with every eye closed and every head bowed, would you just, right there where you are, would you be bold? And would you just stand in your seat and, and just say, I just received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Is there one here that received Jesus right now? Just stand and just say, I just prayed that prayer. I just prayed that prayer. Christians, the question for you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the, the question is, is there any fruit? Is there any fruit in your life? Have you been hollering out, save me, save me, but you haven't been say, saying, save me, Lord? Right now, if you want to tell the Lord Jesus that I'm going to be more than leaf, and I'm going to be fruit, I'm going to let you be Lord in my life. I'm going to let you change me. Just pray this prayer. Oh God, I repent of my sin. I give you permission to change me in any way you want. I give permission that you would allow me to follow in your footsteps. Give me the strength and the faith that is necessary to live a life of holiness and praise and worship. Allow my life to have fruit. Allow my life to have fruit. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let's stand. The band's going to come. We're going to close with the band. If you don't, if you don't realize, we have a less of a band today, but that's just because we think we're a little. Everybody's a little tired, in my opinion. So I asked uh, some of the band to sit down and uh, just to take a break because uh, we have we have a band that's so awesome and so wonderful, and they they show their fruit every week. They come morning and evening, and they show fruit and fruit. They said, "Let me, let me, let me serve the people," and and I just said, "You know what? I think you guys are tired." And so I want you to take a break. And uh, so you may see that in the future where we have the Sundays where somebody's sitting down. I want you to understand that the pastor had to intervene and say, you know what? Too much fruit. <laughs> Too much. Too much fruit. I love you guys. But, you know, these branches are going to break right off. All right. <laughs> it's too much. And so I love that. I love that. Let that be true of you. Let it be true that the pastor would come to you and say, you know what? I love that you want to serve. But I think you need to take a step down every once in a while, just for your own sake. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome if every Christian in the United States that followed Jesus was giving so much that other per people were worried about him? That would change this country probably in one week. Let that be true of our lives. Let's sing.